Thank you, Rich. So um, I'm going to try and, and uh, take a broad sweep of uh, uh, developments in mathematical economics um, in the 50s and, and 60s. And um, without going too far, we can't really you know, get very far in, uh, in the time we have. But the, the aim here is to give you a sense of how uh, developments in mathematics affected in very important ways uh, the progress in economic theory during that period of time. That was a very critical period in which uh, many of the uh, many of the approaches that were uh, formulated have had a very long-lasting impact on the way in which economics has developed. So all of that may not be clear from this talk, of course, but uh, I'm going to try and give you an overview of of the developments that took place um, in the <coughs> 50s, more or less. And it has to do with the problem of uh, the existence of equilibrium in, uh, in e economic models and its um, relationship to uh, fixed point theorems. So uh, essentially, there are you know, two very big strands in, uh, in uh, economics that deal with the equilibrium theory. Uh, the one that has a much longer history in economics is general equilibrium theory, which has to do with the uh, problem of resource allocation with lots of consumers and a lot of uh, producers, uh, all of whom interact through a market. So this is very much the theory of the price system and markets. Um, goes back to Adam Smith. Uh, the formulations that um, will be important for what we do uh, however, had to wait until the 50s before things actually uh, came to the point of being uh, made uh, rigorous enough to be, uh, you know, something you could you could study with these tools. Uh, so this theory has to do with individuals who are rational, who do the best they can for themselves, and there are lots and lots of them. Uh, they interact through the price mechanism. They look at the prices for various things and decide what to do, whether it is. Uh, how many apples and oranges to consume, or whether it is um, how much wheat to produce. And in uh, equilibrium, the prices uh, equilibrate to make sure that demand equals supply, and ultimately this corresponds to a certain allocation of resources in the economy. Now, this has turned out to be very, very important in, in economics because one of the implications of this uh, theory is that, that there are some nice properties to the outcome of this uh, way of allocating resources. And under certain conditions, it leads to uh, what's known as Pareto uh, efficiency, which is to say that the way in which resources get allocated through this mechanism is such that uh, no one could step into the system, change things, and make everybody better off. Okay? So here, the, the essential uh, message in the end is that under certain conditions, when you let people follow their self-interest, that selfish uh, behavior leads ultimately to a good way of doing things. Uh, this is based on having a large number of agents, a large number of people uh, doing the best they can. And the other strand, uh, which is uh, much more recent historically, is game theory, which studies the strategic behavior of rational players. So that may make it seem like, well, how is this any different from, from general equilibrium theory? Well, first of all, this is not necessarily uh, about people making decisions in the context of a marketplace. Uh, secondly, and this is the more important distinction, is that here the behavior of the, uh, of the players these rational individuals who are, again, uh, seeking uh, to maximize their own welfare, uh, that behavior uh, involves interacting with other rational players. So the interaction here is directly between the people who are in their own self-interest, doing their own thing to, uh, uh, in their own, you know, to maximize utility or profit or whatever. Okay. But the interaction is direct. And uh, what you do affects me. Whereas in the general equilibrium theory with competitive behavior, uh, you may have some effect on the price of wheat, but it's negligible. So my interaction with you is very indirect. It is through the marketplace. And it may be so indirect as to sort of make it negligible, the effect that you would have on my decision making. 
Whereas in, in um, game theory, especially in non-cooperative game theory, uh, people interact uh, very directly with each other. And you have a multiple um, set of players, all following their self-interest, and they all realize that the actions that other people take have an impact on their well-being. So what does one mean by rationality in this setting? So that's, you know, that's sort of the first question in this, in this theory. So let me quickly <coughs> start from the scratch as it were. So what makes the, the, the things I just talked about different from the very simple idea that you know, rationality presumably means that you do the best you can for yourself? Well, the simplest place to begin is decision theory. And um, in this uh, framework, you, um, you say, as, you know, this is as simple as it can get, you, um, you are the decision maker, uh, you have a bunch of um, uh, different um, alternatives, and you have to pick one of them. So what do you do? Uh, if there is a way of measuring the, the payoff, the satisfaction that you get from these different objects, then things become fairly straightforward. If you're talking about you know, getting a certain amount of money by picking one or the other thing, then um, you just measure the, the, the utility you get from this in terms of money. Otherwise, there is, let's say, some other way of measuring uh, the gain that you get by picking x versus y. Well, if it's as simple as that, what does rationality mean? It means simply that you make a choice from this set that maximizes the value of this function, u of x. Okay. Now, this is this is the point at which both general equilibrium theory or, or game theory would enter and say, well, we are now going to study a situation that's uh, much more interesting and uh, perhaps more complex. But the the central idea of rationality is not going to change. So that's what we mean by rationality in decision theory. In game theory, where we have a, a multiple um, number of individuals, each trying to maximize their utility, uh, the way this changes, so it of course wouldn't change if you had people who, whose, whose actions didn't affect other people's actions. Right? So you could just take one decision maker and if you had 10 decision makers and their decisions didn't affect other people's decisions, there'd be nothing new. What's, what's important here is that <coughs> if you uh, consider the utility that one individual gets, that depends now not only on this person's decision or choice from this person's collection of, of choices, but also on what other people choose. So that's what makes this interesting. So now rational behavior must be defined subject to the rational choices of others. Uh, and we'll see in a minute what, what, what this will mean. Uh, but let me just point out one, uh, one uh, quick um, observation here, is that this uh, idea of rational uh, behavior by one individual who is affected by the choices of other rational individuals uh, is not the same as decision, the decision theoretic problem, nor is it the same as decision theory under uncertainty. So you might imagine that if you are a decision maker making a decision under uncertainty, you know, the choices you make will depend on certain things, on the state of nature. But that's very different from, from the payoff you get depending on the actions of other people. And more importantly, other rational individuals who have a similar self-interest. Um, as I said, uh, you know, price theory and general equilibrium theory predate game theory as it were in the development of ideas in, in economics. And this is one quick illustration of how, uh, how um, uh, people's um, views have evolved over 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, so, 1969, um, this is uh, what uh, a prominent economist uh, had to say about game theory. Um, and, and this uh, reflects the idea that, well, game theory is all about paradoxes, particular examples, um, and doesn't really help us solve any problems. This was the view of at least one, um, one very important economist. This is uh, Paul Samuelson, just a couple of years before he got his uh, Nobel Prize. Um, fast forward to, you know, 2004, and of course everything's changed. There is, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's been a Hollywood movie on, on game theory of beautiful mind, and all of a sudden, you know, people are looking uh, differently at this. Uh, so to know game theory now is to say that it's a, 
is to change your lifetime way of thinking. Now this too <coughs> is, 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 um, is from a very important economist. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I say all of this just to give you a sense of how things evolve, um, and, and I think it's probably a, a reflection on, on uh, the greatness of Paul Samuelson to be able to say this in 2004. Um, so this is a, a, an example just to uh, set, set the you know uh, uh, to, to set some ideas as we move on, and you may uh, many of you may be familiar with this, so I will uh, try to go through this very very quickly. It, 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 it's, um, it's a way of, of illustrating uh, how it is that uh, rational behavior is by individuals is not quite the same thing as uh, trying to do the best thing you can collectively, uh, which was the message from Adam Smith and so on. So we have two prisoners who have been um, questioned separately. They've been um, arrested for a, for a crime. The DA doesn't have a, a lot of evidence, has some. And uh, the idea is to get each one of these guys to confess. Um, it's important that they, the prisoners, cannot communicate with each other. They are being held separately. Uh, they know that all of this is happening. That's not an issue. It's not as if they don't understand how this is going to uh, be played out. Uh, and they have the option to either remain silent or to confess. Uh, and the length of uh, the term that they'll get <coughs> to spend in jail depends on the answers that both of them give, or whether both of them remain silent or, or confess, or what each one of them does. And, and this, is, uh, this is supposed to uh, reflect what the outcome will be as a function of what these two, uh, these two uh, say. If, um, so in this matrix, let me just just uh, uh, clarify what the numbers are. So uh, the, on the row, we have uh, the player who is making the choice of a row is Bonnie. Clyde is choosing between the two columns. And each one has the choice of either remaining silent or confessing. And within each of these cells, uh, we see how many years they will be spending in, in prison, uh, depending on what has been said or not said. If they both remain silent, they are both in prison for five years. So the first number is supposed to represent the number of years for uh, the row player, Bonnie, the second number for the uh, column player, Clyde. Okay. So if they're both silent, they get five years each. If Bonnie is silent and Clyde confesses <coughs> this uh, as a reward for uh, truth telling, uh, Clyde is only going to be in prison for a year, and Bonnie gets 30 years. Okay. Uh, if they both confess, they get 10 years each. Uh, and similarly, this is uh, symmetric. Uh, if Bonnie confesses and Clyde is, is, is silent, then Bonnie gets a year and, and uh, Clyde gets 30. Okay? So uh, it's as simple as this. Okay? So this is, this is the, the situation confronting these two people. They are rational. They are interested in maximizing their own payoff. And here, uh, obviously, the best thing for any one of these guys would be to spend only a year in jail, and the worst thing possible is to be there for 30 years, right? <coughs> now, they know, they know this matrix, they know this picture, both of them, and they are rational, that's all we need to assume. Um, the other implicit assumption here is that not only can they not communicate with each other after they've been shown this picture, but they cannot, um, well, that's it. So they, you know, they, they, they have to independently make their choice and then what's going to happen is based on this. So, uh, what are rational strategies uh, for these two people to choose? Well, one simple way of at least looking at this particular example is, is, is this. Think about Clyde's decision. This is the person who's choosing uh, one of the columns. Okay? So, if you're Clyde, you say, look, I have to choose uh, to remain silent or to confess. I know that the outcome, the payoff that I get, will depend then on not only what I have chosen to do, but what Bonnie has chosen to do. And that I cannot control. I have no control over that. Okay. So I can, I can say, let me leave out from this matrix the payoffs corresponding to Bonnie, because Clyde is looking at this, and Clyde doesn't care what payoff Bonnie is getting. Right. So, so this is all that matters to Clyde, are the numbers we see in here. 
So if you look at um, what happens in the first column, if Clyde decides to remain silent, he's going to get either uh, five years in jail or 30, depending on what Bonnie does. Cannot control that, but do know what's going to happen. So you can ask the following question. I cannot control what Bonnie does, but if I knew that Bonnie was going to remain silent, what would I do? I'd clearly confess. If Bonnie were to confess, know once again that the best thing to do is to confess. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Regardless of Bonnie's choice, um, Clyde's optimal choice is to confess. Okay? So this is, in a sense, a very compelling sort of example. That's why it's, 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 uh, it's, it's so, uh, so popular. Right? Then you don't have to make a lot of difficult arguments to, to make this very simple claim. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's true that my payoff depends on what the other person does, but my best choice is always the same. Yeah? Good question, no. So this is known as a dominant strategy for Clyde because the, the best thing to do turns out to be independent of the other person's action. The payoff is not, but the best choice is. And for our purpose, that's all that matters in trying to define uh, rational behavior. That's the behavior we need to predict. Well, uh, things are pretty symmetric, so if we were to redo this for the role player and, and ask, well, what should Bonnie be doing? Uh, now just look at the first... Uh, uh, pay off in each of these cells and come to the same conclusion. Um, if Clyde is silent, Bonnie should confess. If Clyde is going to confess, then again, <coughs> Bonnie should confess. So, uh, they both have dominant strategies. They're sort of the obvious rational choices. So, what happens in this game? They're both rational and they end up, both end up confessing. They have 10 years each. You might say, well, okay, but that's, that's the that's the conclusion, so that makes sense, and that's it. Why is this a dilemma? Um, that's one reason it's a dilemma, is that here, rational behavior, where there's absolutely no question, I would say, about what rationality means. Rational individual behavior on the part of these two players leads them to 10 years each in jail. But this is... <coughs> you know, if they had chosen to remain silent, both of them, they would have been in jail only for five years. So, in some ways, you have to wonder whether this is rational. We've gone through the argument as to why uh, they both have dominant strategies each and they should both confess. That's always the, the best thing to do. That's a rational thing to do. But what what uh, comes out as an implication of rationality is something that is not what you might say group rational or socially rational. They both ended up following their self-interest and in the end uh, they are at a point where um, it's, it's worse for both of them than some other choice of action. Okay. So this is, the, this is the dilemma. It depends basically only on one uh, implicit assumption which is that these two guys cannot write a binding agreement and cooperate. If they could, so how would they possibly get to the better outcome? Uh, if they could uh, go to a lawyer, sign an agreement, uh, get it notarized or whatever, and then say, well, if we ever get caught, we are both going to remain silent. And if you um, renege, then nameless things will happen to you. Okay? If they could do that, then the whole story changes, right? Because then, and that is really the only way in which you could see them sustaining the much better outcome. But if they are not able to col uh, collaborate, or if they are not able to cooperate once they are in this situation, then they are doomed to be rational. Yeah. Sorry, is that the case that the, the whole matrix changes? Why does the matrix change? You would say sign and Yeah, but one, one shorthand way of, of dealing with those sorts of situations is to say that people can write binding agreements and we are not going to have to describe all of the details of those binding agreements. Okay, so this is 
this is just to, to uh, draw a sharp contrast between the implicit assumptions here and what is part of another theory of cooperative games, which, which really I'm not going to talk about. So, so, but you're right. I mean, in any of these situations, you could put in enough details to try and describe every conceivable outcome. Uh, but still, I think the important thing is take this example the way it is, and it gives you a certain conclusion. Okay? Now, in many games, players don't have dominant strategies, and so things, this argument of trying to to, to understand what uh, rationality means, what a player will do, is no longer that simple. So, if um, I, I had numbers like this, for example, uh, look at the column player. I've written down the payoffs to the column player. And now this person doesn't have a dominant strategy. Left would be the best thing to do if you knew that the row that's going to be chosen is up. And right would be the best thing to do if you knew that the row that's going to be chosen is down. Right? So now it's not so clear what this person should do. And this makes it different from the, from the prisoner's dilemma. And that example, the prisoner's dilemma was, was constructed in a way to make one point very, very forcefully, which it did that rational behavior where we didn't have to question what it meant, led to an outcome that was socially inefficient. So here, um, we can't be sure what this person would do. This person will have to make at least some conjectures about how up or down is going to come about. If you were, um, <coughs> if you were uh, choosing between two lotteries, and up and down were you know, two different states of nature, and you assign some probabilities to them, you'd be able to to, to figure out how to evaluate 3, 0, or 2, 1 based on the probability of up. And that would be decision theoretic. That wouldn't be a game. What would make this a game is, up, is if up or down is being chosen by somebody else. Then um, I have no business really saying, uh, let me assign some probability to that person's uh, action without looking at things from that person's point of view. Because that's not some random act of nature, that is some other rational individual who is similarly motivated to maximize his payoff. So to figure that out though, I would need to know what the other numbers are in this, in this, uh, in this matrix. Right? Now if it turns out that when I put in numbers uh, for, for, player, uh, for the row player who is playing up or down, if, for example, down turns out to be a dominant strategy for that player, then we can predict that the column player will play right. Okay, but only in that case. So it's going to depend on what numbers we put into that. Uh, into that. Such as this is the case where down is a dominant strategy for the row player, and so right becomes the rational choice for the column player. And then we would predict that the outcome is going to be down and right. Okay, but. Um, this is the situation where neither one of them has a dominant strategy. Now what happens? Now what do we say? What do we mean by um, an equilibrium when you have two rational players? Can up and right be an equilibrium outcome? Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you know, if you if you want to go back and look at this, uh, you should be able to. To, to convince yourself that that should not be an equilibrium with two rational players if they both knew that the other was going to be playing this strategy, making this choice. For example, the, the, the column player uh, should then uh, decide to move left if he expects uh, the row player to be playing up. So let me let me now just move into a more general framework where that you know these are the examples we, we, we constructed two players with two strategies but in general you might have um, a collection of players finite set of players and each one of them has a collection of strategies and that strategy set is xi so uh, the utility function which is defined over those strategy sets together those two things for each one of these players is a normal form game. Each player strategy set, the Cartesian product of these xi's is x. And um, very important here is the um, idea that i's utility depends not just on xi, it maps from x to the 
to the real. So i's utility depends on xi and xj and all, all the uh, actions, all the strategies chosen by uh, the entire collection of pairs. So where i chooses little xi from xi, that's the only thing I can do. Uh, but the payoff, the utility, depends on the independent choices of all the pairs, i.e. it depends on x. And, of course, some of these things are the result of choices of other players. We've just seen examples of two-player games with, with, the, with strategy sets that had only two, uh, two elements. So a rational uh, uh, player presumably chooses a strategy that maximizes uh, utility, but this must now depend on what other people are doing. So uh, clearly the following thing we should be able to, uh, to, uh, to accept, that if you told me that, so x minus i refers to all the xj is not equal to i, so these are the action strategies chosen by everybody other than player i. So if this is known, uh, my choice of xi uh, should be simply a matter of maximizing the function ui given x minus i. Right? So what I have is a, is a mapping from x minus i to xi. This um, set of maximizers of a utility function as a function of other people's uh, strategy choices is uh, known as the best response mapping or the best response correspondence. So uh, for each player there is a, there is a mapping phi i from x to xi which, which simply tells us what the best choices would be of this person as a function of other people's um, um, choices. Now this by itself doesn't do you a lot of good because ultimately you want to know what other people's choices are going to be. Okay, where is this mapping of things going to settle? So here's the definition of uh, an equilibrium. Okay, so you may or may not have dominant strategies, but um, a Nash equilibrium is sort of, uh, you know, it's a natural way if you looked at the previous slide of how we define the best response correspondence is a strategy profile of some x bar such that each player's choice, that is x bar i, is a best response to the choices of all the others. So if you have two players, each one is playing a best response to the other. So the two choices must be mutual best response. <laughs> that was true in the prisoner's dilemma and, and um, you know, in the second example as well. So dominant, if you have dominant strategies, they will have these, you know, this property of, of being an Ash equilibrium. Yeah, so if, if you go back to the to that other example where we did have dominant strategies, uh, here are two Nash equilibria, up and left. Uh, this is a Nash equilibrium because, <coughs> because it, it meets this uh, meets this condition for both of them. If the row pair is playing up, then indeed left is the best response. And if the column player is playing left, up is indeed a best response, better than going down. Okay. And this also turns out to be another equilibrium. So this is a way of moving beyond uh, games in which um, you have dominant strategies. It's nice if you could do that, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not always the case that you find uh, dominant strategies. Now, uh, you know, the, the equilibrium concept that I just mentioned, uh, uh, this one, uh, is now known as a Nash equilibrium. It, 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 um, it comes from um, Nash's uh, um, PhD dissertation, uh, and the paper was published in 1950 and then another one a few years, uh, a few years later. And this is essentially the way in which he described equilibrium. Um, I should say that in the economics literature, there were things of this kind that had already been discussed, but um, uh, principally uh, an economist, a French economist from the 19th century, um, Cournot, who had talked about um, um, firms 
making their production decisions depending on other people's, other firms' production decisions. So there were a lot of things uh, in the literature that were related to this sort of thing, but never at this level of generality. And um, while this was going on, the reason I, I'm mentioning uh, this uh, from the theory of games and economic behavior, a book by von Neumann and Morgenstern. This was published in 44, and this is uh, responsible for a lot of the developments in game theory, but in fact, it's responsible for um, for much of the, the mathematization of economics that took place. And this is a sort of statement that you would not have seen um, in an economics paper at that time. And, and this is there, um, so it's not related to the equilibrium concept that, that I just mentioned. Uh, for Neumann and Morgenstern were, were selling the notion of a, of a solution, which I'm not going to describe. Uh, it ultimately did not turn out to be uh, that fruitful. Uh, a very interesting notion of equilibrium. But as they described it, they said that there can, of course, be no concessions as regards existence. Um, if it should turn out that our requirements concerning the solution are in any special case unfulfillable, I mean, these are pretty strong statements. They would throw the whole theory out, they said. Yeah. Um, thus, a general proof uh, for all particular cases, and look at this footnote. This is meant especially for the economics audience in, in the 40s. What does it mean for a general proof of existence? It means in the terminology of game, for all number of participants and for all possible rules of the game, you know, so it's not going to be satisfied if you if you can show existence of three or four or five player games, but in general. Okay. And uh, this is the background to uh, to Nash's um, um, uh, result, uh, which is on the existence of um, equilibrium, of what we now call a Nash equilibrium. Are there sufficient conditions under which you can show that um, a game will possess uh, at least one Nash equilibrium. By the way, I should I should mention what what this is. You know, there's more to the obviously to, to what they have to say about about equilibrium and existence. But von Neumann Morgenstern also uh, um, made the uh, the the claim that uniqueness in these sorts of models was not to be had, and one shouldn't be expecting that. But existence, of course, there should be no, uh, no concessions on. And, and that turned out to be, to be prescient. I mean, it's, it is extremely um, um, difficult. It's only in very special cases that in these economic models one can hope for uniqueness. So this is uh, the result that Nash proved uh, while he was a second year graduate student at Princeton, uh, that every finite game possesses an equilibrium in in uh, mixed uh, And this proof turns out to require a fixed point here. Um, trying to, to, to think about the, the, um, the history of fixed point here in economics, but I think for all practical purposes, this was the first uh, application of a fixed point here. Uh, in economics. Um, in, uh, in the von Neumann Morgenstern book, there is a reference to Kakutani um, uh, for showing, um, for using a fixed point theorem to prove one of the results in von Neumann Morgenstern. So the first, uh, first theorem, this is one that, that's been used a lot in economics, is Broward's fixed point theorem, which says that, that if you have a function, um, a continuous function from a non-empty, compact, convex subset in RL, uh, then this f has a fixed point. There is some x bar uh, at which is equal to its image. Um, so if, if my set x, this compact, convex subset, happens to be um, the interval 0, 1, I can draw a picture to show what this must mean, that if I, if I were to look at the graph of any continuous function from 0, 1 to 0, 1, it must cross the, the 45 degree line. Of course, it may cross it many, many times, but it has to cross it somewhere, at least once. And then, uh, what has turned out to be uh, far more applicable in economics is the generalization of Broward's 
uh, fixed point theorem. This is Kakutani's fixed point theorem. Uh, so here you have not a function, but a multi-valued mapping by a correspondence from a non-empty compact uh, convex set to itself. And the conditions on this, on this mapping are that it should be non-empty, convex value, and should have a closed graph or upper any continuous. <coughs> then this mapping has a fixed point. So now for every x, you have a set phi of x that that is the image. And if that is convex valued, and if the graph is is uh, is closed, then you get a generalization of Brouwer's fixed point here. So again, you may have lots of fixed points, but there will be at least one. Now, it's easy to see that you can't easily drop any one of these conditions. Convex valuedness is, is essential, of course. So is the fact that it has a closed graph. Yes. Now, what does this have to do with the existence of uh, an equilibrium? So let's go back to the definition of, of uh, a Nash equilibrium. Uh, so each player has a best response correspondence, the mapping from x to xi. And if this has, uh, if, if this is convex value, and if it has a closed graph, then we'll be in business. And this is pretty easy to see. So now, you take the product of all of these mappings from x to xi. So you take the product of these, and you get a mapping from x to x. As a product of non-empty, convex valued mappings with closed graphs, all of those properties will be inherited by this pattern. And a fixed point of this is nothing other than an equilibrium. Okay. So Kakutani's fixed point theorem will do the job. In fact, it's interesting that Kakutani, when he, when he, when he, um, when he published his paper generalizing Brouwer's fixed point theorem, um, like everybody was expected to do, he had, had to show some application to why this was, you know, this was important. And his application was to a result of von Neumann on two-person games. Had he simply said that instead of two, if you had n players, the same thing is true, he would have been, you know, he would have there right there the definition of this equilibrium. But but he didn't. He, he, he was simply looking for an application and he found one, and that was it. But it, it's really only a very small step from that to what Nash was doing. And, and, and for this mapping to have these properties, it turns out that it's enough if the strategy sets are compact and convex, and the utility functions are continuous and quasi-concave. And, um, and with this, you can go to town with all kinds of economic models in which this will turn out to be true. Oh, uh, this, uh, th this is a paper by Nash, the first one in 1915, the Proceedings of uh, National Academy of Sciences. It begins here and ends this, less than a page. But it's more or less what I what I showed you in the, on the previous slide, and uh, I should also mention the author is indebted to Dr. David Gale for suggesting the use of Kaputani's theorem. At this time, David Gale was uh, uh, a faculty member in uh, the math department at, at Brown, so it was much before he left for for work. Um, so, so uh, Nash in his dissertation did have a proof, but it was apparently very complicated. And uh, David Gale, who was a fellow graduate student there, um, suggested that he take a look at Kaputani's theorem, and, and that's going to uh, give him a much better proof. So maybe, you know, when you look at all of this, um, it doesn't seem all that surprising when you hear stories. These are all stories that I really don't know. This is from, you know, from that uh, book on which the uh, movie Beautiful Mind was, was uh, based, uh, that um, when Nash went to von Neumann, very excited with what he had, uh, apparently von Neumann uh, was not impressed at all because he said, well, it's, it's just a fixed point there. What's, you know, what, what's the big deal? But it turned out to uh, have a very big impact on, on economics, the fact that you could, you could use this uh, to talk about um, equilibria and, and you were able to uh, assure yourself that under certain conditions, you can um, you can um, you know you can say that an equilibrium will exist. Of course, a lot of the work in, in these applications has to do with checking and making sure that all the conditions of, of the fixed point theorem are going to work. And sometimes that's you know that's that's not in itself that that trivial. Anyway, 
that's the that's the the, the quick look at at uh, um, fixed point theorems in uh, the development of game theory. Okay. So I'm stopping short of all the things that happened after that, but um, this is this is how fixed point theorems essentially um, began their journey in economics, and it was to last a very very long time. So now I go back to that older um, equilibrium theory that predates uh, all of this. And this is general equilibrium theory to this market economy. In a way, that model is very complicated. It's not as simple as you know strategy sets for a finite number of pairs, utility functions, define the equilibrium, and it's very, very close to the fixed point theorem. To see why uh, you will need something like a fixed point theorem. And you can't do with something uh, more relevant. This is a little more involved, but it has a longer history in economics, and here again, uh, the, the fundamental development came in the 50s, very shortly after uh, Nash's application to his problem. So here you have a finite set of consumers. These are going to be the agents like the players. There are commodities, finite number of them with market prices. Each uh, consumer has a utility function and has an endowment, and you can define this very simple exchange economy. Notice uh, the similarities with, with what we just saw in a normal form game. Uh, the simple thing here is going to be that the utility function of player i will only depend on i's consumption. So my utility just depends on, on the apples and oranges I consume. It's not affected by your consumption of apples and oranges. But the constraints on my behavior uh, come from market prices. So my feasible set from which I make my choices Unlike the game theoretic model where it was fixed, here it's going to keep changing as the market prices change. So given uh, market prices, which we'll be able to take without loss of generality for each commodity to be sitting in the unit simplex in RL, uh, given these prices, each person has a wealth which depends on endowment and the prices. These are the market uh, conditions. And then the consumer's problem this is a decision problem, pure and simple, is to take, as given the price, uh, one price for each commodity, choose something to maximize utility, but there's a constraint. You have to choose something from some large set with the added constraint that the total expenditure not exceed your total income. So now your choice set begins to change as the market prices change. Uh, this is the typical, you know, uh, intermediate microeconomics picture of a consumer who is given this budget line, trying to reach the highest possible uh, utility, and um, of course, you know, if you have enough smoothness and so on, you can begin to talk about the <laughs> characterization of the solution to this problem with, you know, it's a constraint optimization problem. If you have a unique solution, then you have a function. Uh, which we call the demand function. This tells me how this consumer's optimal choice of apples and oranges and so on is a function of the market prices. So depending on the market prices, I, I maximize my utility by making a particular choice. That function is the demand function. If you sum it across all these consumers, it's the aggregate demand function. This tells me that as a function of, of market prices, how these rational consumers will show up demanding so many apples, so many oranges, and so on. What's the equilibrium problem? Well, the problem is to find or to be sure that there exists some price at which all these markets will clear. That is to say that this L-dimensional um, aggregate demand is equal to the aggregate supply, the supply of apples and oranges and so on. So, uh, this is all sitting in RL, so you have L equations to say that the aggregate demand for apples must equal the aggregate supply of apples, and similarly for oranges and so on and so forth. And the question is, uh, before we pay any attention to Adam Smith and everybody else who followed him, can we be sure that this model is coherent in the sense that there is even the possibility that there is some collection of market prices at which this will all happen. 
So this is this is not the more difficult question of how where do the market prices come from? And, and, and I should confess, even now we don't really have a good answer to that question. But but a preliminary question is this. Let's let's not worry about how prices emerge, whether price will go up when demand goes down or that's that's much more complicated. Forget the dynamics. For the for the for the moment, the quest, the preliminary question is if this theory is to be taken seriously, and now you know this is where uh Neumann Martin's turn from 44 uh, becomes relevant to people working in the city economy is to say, look, uh, what are the conditions under which an equilibrium exists? So if Adam Smith was, was able to convince us with his stories about how um, the invisible hand will take care of all market steering and why in the end this will be a nice thing for society, let's at least be sure that in our model there is um, at least one P bar at which this happens. Because if it doesn't, then you know, those topics don't correspond to this model and we don't know what that's telling us about um, about the way in which resources are getting allocated in this free enterprise economy. So this uh, price and this collection of demands we, we call a competitive equilibrium. Now, one of the reasons that this is this is so important in economics is, is because there is a welfare theorem which says that if, if you look at a competitive equilibrium, you'll find that the allocation corresponding to it, that is the consumption of all these consumers, will turn out to be Pareto efficient. So unlike the prisoner's dilemma, rational behavior here will lead to a social, socially efficient outcome. It won't be the case that these people could have made a different choice uh, in their consumption uh, plans and found that all of them would have been able to get higher utility. That's not possible. And it depends, of course, on the implicit assumption that ui is a function only of xi, not of all the x's. So um, does there exist an equilibrium? Can we find sufficient conditions under which an equilibrium exists? So that becomes a big question. And as you can see, this is a somewhat more complicated model in which to set it all up and then get to the point where you can actually point to what it is that you mean by the existence uh, problem. But there you have it. Okay? And so, no surprise, to answer this, you'll need a fixed point here. <coughs> in fact, there is a very um, uh, precise way in which it turns out that you couldn't solve this problem with anything you know, uh, that wasn't equivalent to a, to a fixed point here. So we have to find a, a, a P in the simplex such that aggregate demand equals this, this given uh, point in RL aggregate supply. Now, if I were to just write down <coughs> the following function, f of p is as p plus psi of p minus omega, if I found a fixed point on this, I'd be done, right? <coughs> but cannot apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem to this even if psi is a continuous function because this, uh, yeah, this, is, not a, this is not amenable to the, to the fixed point um, argument because it's not mapping from a set back to itself. It's, 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 it's going off into somewhere else in our head. So, um, we cannot apply a Brouwer six point theorem, and, and, and so you have to do something more. But this is, this is where, you know, one might begin to see where uh, you need that, uh, uh, that tool. But you can modify this function, you can do something like this, um, look at the aggregate demand, subtract the supply, mess around with the prices to bring them back into the simplex, and this turns out to be an inward pointing map. It turns out because of other assumptions in the model. Interestingly, this is exactly the kind of thing that Nash did in his second proof of the existence of a Nash equilibrium. It's a mapping of this kind. It looks very much like this. So, um, so you have to work on this, and in the end it turns out that, that this is how you show the existence of an equilibrium. So Arrow and Debro and McKenzie, this was in 54, um, they, they used um, Kaputani's fixed point theorem uh, to, show, to, to, to show under certain conditions the existence of a competitive equilibrium. Okay. And then people began to see the connection with, with Nash and how the two were very closely related. So in some sense, uh, these are much more involved arguments 
But at the heart of all of this is still the idea of finding a fixed point. Uh, cooperative game theory, I said I wouldn't talk about it, so I won't. But, but this is another branch of, of game theory, which looks very different from non-cooperative game theory. And equilibrium concepts over there, until here I, I should, should say the difference is that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people didn't really see a connection between those existence results and fixed point theorems. Well, they must have because they were related to the KKM theorem, but, but you know, directly to Kakutani or Brower, the, the, the connection wasn't there. Uh, but eventually that too has, has come. So now it turns out that a lot of these things can be um, seen from the point of view of, uh, say, Kakutani's fixed point theorem. So let me, let me stop here. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. System exhibit a fixed point. Okay. Is there an actual fixed point? Is there an actual equilibrium in the system? That, in the data? So in the data. Well, that uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> from the you see, once once you look at one of these uh, existence results, they tell you what conditions you need on the primitives. So if it's a game, you need to be sure that the uh, strategy sets are compact and convex, and that the payoff functions are continuous. So as long as that's true, you don't really need to go to the data. Right? Now, the problem with going to the data is that this is all about existence. There's no dynamics here. So what happens if you're out of equilibrium? So whenever you go to the data and ask people things, you're never sure that the answer you're getting has to do with an equilibrium or with some out of equilibrium uh, phenomenon. So the existence uh, <laughs> results are not really that well suited for, uh, you know, empirical tests. Other than you could say, well, you know, if you have a game, check whether the, the strategy sets are compact or not. And if you want to look at a, a model that has other features, then you may have to do other things. So in fact, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, development that came later, after Arrow and Debro and Nash, had to do with extending these results to other models. That were not, you know, there you didn't have these assumptions. So people have, have uh, worried about um, what if you had a continuum of players or a continuum of consumers? Uh, what if um, you had non convexities which is very important in, you know, certain areas in, in economics? What if you had public goods and so on? But um, it doesn't really uh, turn out to be something that you would take with the data. So suppose, uh, suppose I'm, a, uh, I'm a producer of, of wheat, okay? and my um, decision my decision is how much wheat to bring to the market. Uh, and, and of course, you know, there are other things behind this. I could produce zero, or I could produce 10, I could produce 20. So I can, let's say, you know, this is a commodity that can be considered to be you know, perfectly divisible. So I can, my, my strategy set then is just some uh, set in, in, um, in R plus, okay? And, and if there is some exogenously given bound which says I can't produce more than 20 trillion tons of wheat, well then, you know, that's my strategy set. And uh, as I said, there'll be more behind the story. If I decide to produce 100 million tons of, of wheat, then it has implications that I need so much land or so much labor and, and this will be my cost and, and all of that. So you could, you could look at um, the particular model you have in mind and ask what the decision variable is for each person. And can it, can it be seen as coming from a compact convex set? Not all is lost though if you don't have that. In fact, what, what Nash was doing was looking at uh, a finite number of uh, uh, strategies. And there, though, you know, you get convexity by mixing, by allowing for mixed strategies. You mentioned that uh, some recent work has involved uh, non convexity Do you need more exotic fixed point theorems to handle that, those situations? Well, um, not so much more exotic fixed point theorems, <coughs> but you have to start um, 
thinking about what sort of uh, you know economic equilibrium concept you might you might then uh, start to look for. So the idea of a competitive equilibrium is basically out of the window once you have non convexities. Um, and yeah, it's simply because you won't you won't have you won't have a fixed point necessarily if, if that mapping is not convex. And there's no way of fixing that other than assuming convex. So when you don't have that, you've got to then begin to think about other concepts of equilibrium. Uh, I've noticed that uh, people have run computational models of the prisoner's dilemma. There's a, uh, there are competitions for this, and the best strategy, uh, in order to make the prisoner's dilemma interesting so that it's not just uh, confess both times, but instead occasionally cooperate, uh, they iterate through the prisoner's dilemma. Do your models for uh, other systems where the payoff matrix is not balanced in the same way account for iterated versions of the game? Well, there is a there is a whole um, field, uh, I would say, of of repeated games, where uh, you know you take something like Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, and you ask, well, under what conditions might things look different? And one of them, and this is an intuitive idea, is that you know if you if you are involved in a repeated uh, interaction with someone, uh, you may be able to sustain. Uh, much more cooperative-like outcomes, uh, rather than uh, a, a situation in which it's a you know once once in a blue moon sort of interaction, where you would have this interaction and then you go away and you never see this person again. The way in which you behave in that is likely to be very different if you are interacting with the same person repeatedly, and you know if you have a finite number of repetitions, theoretically it doesn't change anything. Because when you get to the last stage, suppose we're going to play the prisoner's dilemma ten times. When we get to the tenth one, what should we do? Or what do we expect these guys to do? Right? So that's what's going to happen there. So once you know that, what's going to happen in the ninth one? Well, <laughs> there's nothing to be gained by, by not choosing a dominant strategy. Because you know in the last game that's what, what's going to happen. So if it's finite, it unravels. But if you have infinitely many repetitions of this, then, yeah, there is a folk theorem which says, well, anything goes, essentially. You can sustain all kinds of, of, of uh, behavior as equilibrium behavior in this infinitely repeated game. So that's the, the, the theoretical benchmark. So now, you know, to, to actually looking at people playing these games, I think to the extent that you can, you can, um, you can produce a sort of environment in which people think this is going to be played for a very, 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 very long time. Maybe, you know, you begin to see some of those features of the infinitely repeated game. But if it's, I would say that if it's, if it's understood that it is really is finite and people can see where that ended and how many times it's going to be played, you shouldn't expect a different outcome. Now, there's a lot of work in behavioral economics more recently which, you know, which, which sort of uh, questions this whole uh, notion of rationality that you know people care about other things. And now, once you bring that in, of course, I, this is. Yeah. Sorry. That's a that's that's a very good way of doing it. So in fact, people. Yeah, yeah. So people have looked at that. That that's a very good way of doing it. Where where in fact there's uncertainty about when it's going to end. And that has some of the features of that.